at the end of the day, I don't produce any sound when I come back. You know, uh, they are the ones who create that special magic. And for that, you know, limited amount of time, we have that possibility collectively reach a certain level that's probably not possible for each one of us individually to get. That's the magic of orchestras. <laughs> Welcome to Arts Engines. I am your host, Aaron Dworkin. And with us today as our guest, we have Dmitry Sitkovetsky, who is violinist, conductor, and music director of the Greensboro Symphony, one of our artistic creative partners of Arts Engines. And his contributions to our field have been truly extraordinary. Dima, it is so wonderful to be able to have you on the show. It's great to be here. Uh, and I'm really honored to be here. Awesome. So, you know, there's so many questions I want to ask you, but I thought one, Please. first off, is that you've had, you know, this incredible experience to perform and to conduct on multiple continents, potentially every continent. Um, and so you have really gained, I think, a global perspective on the arts. And what I'm curious is, do you see a difference of different nations that you go to and engage your artistry with? Do you find that there's a different way in which we engage with the arts here in the United States versus Europe versus Russia versus Asia, different nations? I'm just curious if you find that there's a different kind of sense and role that you see the arts playing based on the nation that you're in. Absolutely. And you know, Aaron, it's very, it was very telling now that we are in this most unusual, most extraordinary circumstances where all of a sudden everything came to a halt. You know, nobody was doing anything. It's very significant which countries actually got themselves together and in very soon after all the, you know, uh, barriers that you're not allowed to congregate and this and that, but look, Germany, of course, predictably, where, where the arts play such an important role, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, they seem to be already performing, uh, you know, with the, all the precautions and the limited audience, or sometimes no audience at all, concert bar and all that. Japan seems to be, again, in, a, in pretty good shape. I'm supposed to go there in October. And surprisingly, even a country like Romania, where I'm supposed to go, uh, you know, to a NESCO competition and also to play there. So it's, it's very significant how different parts of the world, especially, of course, parts of Europe, where uh, the government, the state, the land, the city supports, so they can actually afford to put on performances with very, a very few members of the audience, putting musicians safely on stage, doing creative things. Uh, in, in Berlin, they did an opera in a parking lot. <laughs> I mean, how is that? And it had tremendous, tremendous uh, success and desire. There's a great deal of appetite for that. From my experience, it, it's true, I've been pretty much all over the globe. And it's fascinating to see how also how public reacts, uh, the attention span, the importance of the arts, it, it, different on different continents. But ultimately, the good audience, you find almost everywhere. Because the great thing about music that we need no words. You know, it's, it's the old international language. It really is from heart to heart. Music has no difference in age, in religion, in color of the skin, in the background, whether you are well prepared, you really you know, or you, this is your first time, you know, uh, being exposed to music. I remember a fantastic uh, experience in Charlottesville, Virginia. They have this wonderful... Uh, in Cable Hall, you know, University of Virginia, they have a wonderful program, as well as children concerts. So my jumbo orchestra, which performed the night before, 
we did two uh, children, two one-hour shows. Of course, it was just bits from here and there. And I made a little experiment. I put eight-year-old girl in my place in conducting, uh, you know, on, on the podium. And I just conducted with her little hand, you know, the oxer. It was a miraculous experience. I mean, she was in the center of all the music and it seemed like she was commanding it and they were following her and everything. I wish there was, I mean, sort of like being bapti uh, baptized by, by the waves of music. It was an extraordinary experience. Every time I think of it, it's like, so there's no, uh, ultimately, the, the, you know, the experience of being exposed to music could be just as strong. I remember my chamber orchestra gave most memorable concerts in little fishing villages of Finland for an audience of, I don't know, 40, 50 people. You know, compare that with Hollywood Ball of 12,000 people. But it's not the numbers, it's the connection. So that, you know, it makes me think that experience that you created for that young girl, um, I'm curious, going back to your own childhood, what was the spark that created it for you? Obviously, you come from a true legacy of music and musicians. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, was, do you remember when that moment was for you that you realized this, this power and the pull that music was going to have for you? Oh, absolutely. It's very interesting because I think... Uh, you know, babies, even in, in mother's womb, uh, they respond to the sounds around them. And my mother, it was me, my mother being Bella Davidovich, one of the most celebrated pianists of uh, last century, she told me that she, she performed in public up until one uh, uh, evening when she played Beethoven's first piano concerto. And in the last movement, there's, there's a tira -ra -dee -do, tira -ra -dee -do, tira -ra -dee -do. I started to move in her womb so much that she actually had to, you know, she was deep, further from the piano that she, she, she was comfortable. And after that, she stopped the moment. But she, you obviously responded to that in my womb. And it's interesting because when my wife Susan was pregnant with Julia, with our daughter, we were in Israel and I performed nine times Prokofiev first violin concerto. And Prokofiev, ever since Julie was started to understand something later on, became one of her favorite composers. It's, it's interesting because the exposure, even while the child is still... So in my case, I was at a great advantage, of course, having music all around me. And it, it would have been very strange if I didn't become a musician, though it does come with a lot of pressure a lot of pressure and a lot of expectations, which I wouldn't wish on anybody. And now my daughter, you know, the next generation, <laughs> I had four generations, she now has five generations of pressure right. and fear not, not to do as well as the parents and grandparents and grand grandparents and so forth. But of course, it's a great advantage. The more you are exposed to music, you don't have to become a professional musician, but you will always have a connection with it. I cannot stress enough, and this is one of the main, uh, you know, sort of mission statements of Greensboro Symphony, is to bring that music, even to people. I mean, I talk to little kids who come to a concert, they never heard of symphony before, and then they meet the conductor, they meet the soloist. It's a great way of, you know, awakening. So it's interesting, you know, talking about that impact and, and how that exposure at a young age. And um, certainly, you know, here in the States and we're in the midst of all kinds of, you know, racial, cultural turmoil and all of that. Yeah. But certainly in classical music, um, we have a history of, of, you know, not being completely welcoming and of certainly not having the representation that I think all of us really want. And one of the things I've noticed right, is you have been, you know, one of these leaders in bringing artists of color 
to Greensboro, to, you know, to communities where otherwise it may be the artist you bring may be the first artist of color, classical performer that a, a, an audience or community has seen because of this historical context we've had. I'm just curious um, how you've thought about that and why you think that's uh, important and, and what kind of role music can play in these social issues that we face. Absolutely. Well, Greensboro is an interesting town, you know, that's where uh, a lot of, you know, there's a, there's a civil, civil rights museum right there downtown. And it's, it's really been a very important uh, place for breaking the barriers, you know, and traditionally somehow Greensboro, which is quite different from this triad of High Point, which is still the center of you know, furniture market and all of that. And then you have Winston Sound, which is quite different. It's only half an hour away. It's the same airport for all the, but the history of integrating uh, various, uh, you know, cultures is very different from, from each one. And I think Greensboro is really quite ahead and people are much more uh, ready to, uh, you know, to include to include and not to make any difference. Because I personally, you know, I grew up with, uh, believe me, it was not only the Beatles outside of classical music, but it was great jazz. You know, my goodness. I mean, my gods were Louis really Armstrong and Duke Ellington and Ella Fitzgerald and whatever. I, whenever I, I have the time, I always listen to that. And then further on, uh, you know, the great American contribution to the, uh, 20th century has been jazz, uh, you know, soul and rock, which is so, you know, that's where I, you know, when I went to Memphis and I went to the, uh, you know, rock and soul museum, actually, there is this quite, quite remarkable how these two seemingly completely different cultures merge long before the civil rights movement and everything. And enriched each other and, and, and produced great, great uh, musicians. Then, of course, Broadway musical, which probably was before that. And, uh, you know, this is what we have. You know, you have many different, uh, you know, East European Jews, you have Germans, you have Italians, you have Irish, you know, America should really be way ahead of all of that. But of course, it's easier said than done. <laughs> True, true. And so, you know, it's interesting talking about all these different genres of music, right? There are definitely those in our classical music field who, who come from a, a space of purists, right? They're like, we get only class, let's not have any, we don't want rock influences in our music. We don't want, what do you, what do you think about the influences of other genres in the classical sphere? I think it's tremendous. I think if you, if you talk to the jazz, great jazz uh, musicians or great rock musicians or pop musicians, they, they've been influenced by classical music tremendously. And many of them were classically trained. But the other, on the other side of the spectrum, I was in this elite, so-called elite central music school, you know, in Moscow, where all the big talents from everywhere, from Kiev, from Leningrad, Baku, and Yerevan, they will always come there. Uh, but we listen every break between the lessons, you know, it's 45 minute lesson, 15 minute pause. Somebody would come to the piano and play either jazz or, you know, some of the rock when it started, the, 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 the Soviet rock, I was pretty much involved because my first cousin, Alexander Sikletsky, was the head of the, one of the most important and most popular rock groups. So, and that was very much underground at that time. So I was, it seemed also almost like dissident kind of a movement and then the Beatles I knew I could tell you year by year which which you know album came out and then of course uh, you know everything that was great uh, you know made by the great town but I will never forget when I came first when we first met about 10 years ago or no no seven maybe six seven years ago in Napa you know in the Sphinx Ensemble which is a wonderful wonderful group which I had like later also much closer connection. But at that time, there were two soloists. I mean, absolutely world-class talent. It was uh, Julia Bullock, 
this, uh, this singer and the one who just came to us last year and created the sensation, Xavier Foley, who is really one of a kind. He died you know, the stage. <laughs> it really is. A, I was completely bowled over. I mean, what a talent. What, and also the, the people there, and that was wonderful. Uh, you know, uh, well, Kelly, Kelly, Kelly Hope Thompson, okay, who, who yeah. led yeah. wonderful violins, great, great person. So I was very taken. And for me, in any case, I always been, being a Russian Jew uh, in Russia, I was always part of the minority. And we were never, you know, officially we all had equal opportunities, but in practice, in order to be, to become somebody, you had to be not just as good, not just a little bit better. You had to be five times better in order to, and then have the luck. And sometimes somebody's good, you know, push or opportunity to show what you can. So it's, it's, it's a struggle. But I've always been a proud member of minorities anyway. I'm, always, I, I'm, I'm sure I'll die as a minority of some kind. <laughs> So, uh, so unfortunately, we're even running short on time, but one key yes. question I wanted to kind of talk about, which was that, of course, you've mentioned this role that you've had as a conductor. Um, yeah. And I wanted to see kind of different from, you know, really being a, an interpretive artist, right? Being on stage and, and playing as an instrumentalist, but, but actually right. being in the leadership role and, you know, serving as music director at Greensboro, what I'm curious is what are those aspects that you think are important that, are, that you can do in a leadership role that you can't necessarily do when you're just the soloist? Are there, are there things that you feel or responsibilities even that you feel you bear when you're in a leadership role? Absolutely. I think the most uh, satisfying uh, for me uh, to be, there are two things. First of all, to create your Around. It's not, you know, just me being, but it's the effect that a personality has on a group of people. And when there is a glue, there is a certain ethics of even a certain material thing that you can you can feel. Uh, what always seemed to be incredible when I heard Stokowski or the great conductors, how they conducted the same orchestras that I knew, that I performed with, that I conducted with, but they just sounded like Philadelphia, of, you know, the Philadelphia sound of the world. For me, that was quite miraculous. So that was one thing that I was trying to achieve. The other thing I love when I'm able to, just by being there, to raise everybody's standard to a different, to a different uh, plateau. If I am able by, it's not important to, you know, even be sometimes specific about this or uh, this is a little bit out of tune or this is not quite together, but just the energy, the enthusiasm. You have to lead by example and you have to convey your love for that particular piece of music. And then you have to also be receptive to whatever ideas, because at the end of the day, I don't produce any sound when I come back. You know, uh, they are the ones who create that special magic. And for that, you know, limited amount of time, we have that possibility collectively reach a certain level that's probably not possible for each one of us individually to get. That's the magic of orchestras. And for me, that's always been a great, great thrill and, and the aim. <laughs> I just love how you just captured that power of the ensemble uh, under the leadership of a great maestro. Dima, thank you so much. You truly are one of the great arts engines that is powering human creativity in our field. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks so much, Aaron, for having me. It was great, John. Thank you.